um, um, my name is Vivian Pong, and I am the project director of WMA, um, which is the organization behind the exhibition um, and the uh, that is taking place at the Central Library, um, and which will run till the 24th of um, uh, uh, April this month. And I hope that all of you had a chance to um, look at the exhibits there, because this is part of a, a program that extends from the exhibition called Transition. And um, so the ex exhibition um, contains a number of uh, programs, including the finalists of WMA Masters, which is uh, professional photographers and um, image makers. They had uh, submitted their works and entered into like a competition um, that has been going on for several months. And the finalists um, each would be tackling the uh, subject of transition in their own ways, had their works featured at the exhibition, and there are nine of them. Um, tonight, we are delighted to begin with uh, the works of two of those finalists. Actually, one is the winner of this cycle of the uh, of, of the competition. Um, but both of them has have, what they have in common is that they explore transition in the context of urban transition in Hong Kong. And so, this is a panel about that. So, um, helping us moderate this panel is John Batten. Uh, our critic and also the founder of the Central Western Concern Group. Um, so with us are the two artists, Burton Chang, um, and also Yim Soi Fong, who is the, actually the winner of the um, And joining this panel is also Ian Brownlee, um, an urban planner who we have met 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're going to do free flow with language uh, today. I think that sometimes it may be English, sometimes it may be Cantonese. If there's any need, we have some um, simultaneous uh, interpretation device um, outside that you can uh, use. And if you would like to just raise your hand and uh, let us know, we'll just take one of those three lines for you. Um, so I would just give the time to John to have a small regular session. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone. Um, I'd just like to welcome you. And um, we've got, um, I think, about two hours and um, we'll be looking at some images and the rundown for today will be, um, we have our three speakers here. And so Burton will give a brief introduction in a few minutes and then <coughs> Yim Sui Fong and then Ian. And um, we're going to be talking about a number of um, uh, areas, I suppose, and, and a lot of it will be uh, related to the urban environment. Uh, although if any of you had read the essays in the catalogue, you'll see that the word transi transition, of course, covers many areas in Hong Kong. And I think during our, our talk today, we can cover some of those. So it includes politics, uh, transitioning from uh, being a, a British colony to uh, to coming back to, to China, to the mainland, um, and then all the uh, changes that have that have happened in the last 25 years, uh, which some of these essays cover. I have a delicate task today because we have two artists and Ian as a uh, very well-known and very competent urban planner. And I'm just going to declare a little bit of interest. Ian and I have worked together on a, on a, a number of urban planning slash heritage conservation battles with government. Um, and our first big win was the PMQ, when it was the, um, uh, a site, the former police married quarters, and Ian very 
very kindly helped us make a, uh, an application to the town planning board and then we um, had a big battle with government over the site. And so Ian and I uh, have known each other for about, must be 10 years now. And then recently I, I met Yim Sui Fong and uh, Sui Fong uh, set up a, uh, a group called Rooftop Institute and invited me to be a director. Um, and this was about two years ago. And uh, it's a fabulous uh, project that's ongoing uh, that Sui Fong and Lo Yok Mui, her, her partner, have set up. And um, they're doing some really fabulous things um, with, with residencies. Uh, in Hong Kong and around Asia and linking them with, with uh, students in Hong Kong. Burton, I don't know so well, but his photographs are the sort of things I like in photography. They are um, images of interventions, human interventions in the urban landscape. And Hong Kong is a wonderful place to look at and walk around and see these changing <coughs> interventions that, that we make on our, on our landscape. Yim Su Fong has also, um, later today, will be showing a video and each, everyone will be showing a, um, a little PowerPoint presentation. My difficult task is that I need to bring in um, an artistic sensibility within a very tough topic of Hong Kong's changing uh, urban landscape and land use, which is a, a constant topic of conversation in Hong Kong because, of course, as we know, uh, property is expensive here and Hong Kong has only one resource which is constantly exploited and used, and that is land. I thought I'd start today by just quoting um, and some lines from the essay by someone similar to me, a sort of art critic. Let me just read this out. If you've got this, it, it, it's in Chinese as well. If you, if you want to listen to your um, um, uh, translation, it'll be uh, said in Chinese. Uh, Hester Kaiser uh, wrote an essay, and uh, he was a little bit perplexed by the photographs that are on display at the Central Library. I'll quote, Upon seeing the shortlisted works, my initial impression was that of mostly conventional photographs dealing with various aspects of the transition to Chinese rule. Frustratingly enough, they didn't manage to relate what it must feel like to live in a place like Hong Kong, given the changes that are afoot. For all their photorealism, they somehow lacked an element of what makes things real, or what the Chinese curator Wang Chun Chen called a reflection of how our heart truly sees the self and the world. I had expected a sense of the weight that comes from being submerged in hyperinformation, and which I associate with a fracturing of vision to have seat into the image plane. The writer did declare that he'd never been to Hong Kong. And I, I think that's interesting because his, um, his, his comments are really, or well, strike me as someone who doesn't know Hong Kong at all. Because in fact, one of the interesting things about photography in Hong Kong is that the photographs themselves often reflect the culture that we live here. Um, 
although I think the, the writer makes a fair statement to, to challenge photography in Hong Kong and say, well, why haven't you uh, tackled conceptual photographs of Hong Kong? Or another challenge is to WMA itself and ask in the selection process, have you self-selected a particular type of imagery? And so they're, they're sort of questions that I think are relevant when you go to the Central Library and look around because there is certainly a feeling of similarity in, in the photographs. And, and that would be some of the, something we may talk about later. Um, but this is a perfect topic because I think Ian, with his experience of urban planning, we can actually bring in um, you know, the technical reasons of why we are, why we look the way we do, why Hong Kong looks the way it does. And so I think to start with, I'd like to ask Burton to, to show his images and talk about his images. And what each of us will, each of the speakers will talk for about seven minutes. All right. Well, let's try and keep time. And, uh, do I just hit the next bit? No, 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 no. no. Oops, did you go out? So my, uh, my series for this, do I just look at that? I can just do that. Okay. So my series uh, for this um, competition was called um, Tales from the Common Space. And I started off with this picture you see here. And it was uh, shot in Central somewhere where it's, you know, not particularly eye-catching or anything like that, but this uh, this fence or this uh, boarded up wall that, you know, shows some greenery on it kind of interests me because it was uh, inherently, it felt like it was, it, it felt like it was uh, anthropomorphized, let's put it that way. It's leaking in the bottom. Okay, okay, sorry. I'll go closer. Is this good? <laughs> So, as you can see on the bottom, it's, 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 it's leaking on the bottom, like it was, it felt to me like almost like a, a lost child or something that was trying to misidentify with what it was. So, I started with this image because I felt it was one of my, the first ones that kind of felt like it was pulling away from what you can consider, um, uh, a normal construction area. It felt a little bit weird, a little bit creepy. So as we go along, we got this next image that I've shot somewhere in Kowloon, I think. And it, I started to build this dialogue about uh, Hong Kong as I see it, as a, a creature that's uh, continually just growing and shedding its weight, a cycle, if you will. So life and death and uh, repair and disrepair as it sheds its weight, it, it, new things come and go. And I started to think about what, in a lot of ways, how when we see things and we go by them, they sort of disappear in our memories. So capturing them was a way for me to kind of go, I remember seeing it in a certain way, or remember seeing it in another time in a different way. And so it was kind of challenging what you see as this uh, creature that grows and, and, and bits falling apart. And this was uh, near the same area, I guess, and it's, it started to build this dialogue about 
the ups and downs of Hong Kong, how, how close things, uh, the proximity of things change. And along, along the lines of that, I started to see similarities in the things I was shooting. So this is uh, during a, f uh, I think it was a festival time uh, for this particular village. And it was near the end of the festival. I think it was only a week long. It's a 10 year festival and it was at the end of it. And if you just look at it as, uh, they, bu as they build around the, uh, the, you know, they show trying to, excuse me, trying to celebrate this festival, they build around what's existing. So you see the buildings in the background, the trees, and they try to build the structures around that. And I started to find more and more of this stuff, and it started to click. And it goes for many, many, many deep images. Like, I started to think about the practicality of what was going on. Like, why was, this doesn't really make sense to me. How, how does it really, uh, how do you kind of like uh, let things like this happen? The concrete around this, this tree that looks perfectly healthy. I'm sure it was. And it still is. It's starting to fall apart now, I think, within this dense, you know, girder structure. And it started to cross over with these little images like this. And as I said, the anthropomorphizing, like the animalistic qualities of it, like things coming out of the ground, things popping out of the trees and whatnot, I was just matching the images in a particular way. And this, I felt like it was like an exchange of like the organic. It's like a, if you'd spit from your mouth or, you know, you know, expel. It felt this image just ca came across like that. And like the little organic shapes that came across from these constructed areas. And then again and again with this fence as a, a backing image. So, yeah. I think that covers my bit. I, I might just ask you one or two questions just to try okay. and help the audience a little bit. So, you said, how can you let this happen? Can we go back to that, oh, that yeah. slide again? Yeah. I have a sort of theory about this. And actually, like I think <laughs> Hong Kong's a very caring place. And I remember when the, the smoking ban came in mm. and the government immediately put up all these little... Uh, stainless steel boxes uh, for people to put their cigarette butts in. Right. And I, I sort of see this image and the next one as very similar. Uh, that in fact, you know, there's this awful construction going outside and then something of beauty and good luck, you know, the flowers for New Year. And then if you go back to the, the, the top one again, mm -hmm. that you see this, um, this poor palm tree which would have been much easier just to, to cut, mm. but instead they've worked around it. And yeah. I find that quite caring. What do you, what do you think of that, that observation? You, yeah, I think it, you, you have, that's a good way to think about it, but also it's, uh, we go back to your first point about why, it's also that uh, it could have been so much easier to just cut it down. You see how close the, the bottom of it is to that, you know, this, uh, concrete platform just behind it and how much of it is off-center from the middle of the the dirt track. So I felt it was one of those weird, um, I would say, missed, missed opportunities or even missed, like, misconceptions, like someone gave an, an, a gave an, an idea of like, maybe we should do this. And someone went, well, it's going to sound here, and they just ignored a lot of those ideas. <laughs> but, but I think that's what it is like in Hong Kong. Like you mm -hmm. see, when buildings are painted, it's yes. actually left, let, let, uh, let to the painters to decide the colour scheme and mm -hmm. the design. And some of them are wonderful. Yeah. Don't, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. There, there's sometimes when you, you get uh, a lot out of these painting schemes, and sometimes you wonder, 
but why couldn't they just paint that just a little bit more? And they missed out, there's not enough paint? I mean, it's not that difficult. <laughs> okay, one more point. You, you mentioned the word anthropomorphic. Yes. Which is a big word that sort of means um, something that represents a higher being, like a god. Or even an animal. <coughs> or an animal, or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. it That's takes on shape. some shape and form. Mm -hmm. That Could reminds you, you of something. Can you go back to the image where you said that and try and explain that a little bit more? <coughs> Let me see a good. Okay, this is a, gr a great one to begin with. That as a as how the way I've layered the the buildings and then the wall as a kind of a faux foliage, if you will, and then you see the <coughs> only real organic shape in there, which is this puddle. And if you look at it that way, it's kind of like it's a telling. It, I felt I always felt it, it when I look at. Look back at some of my pictures. I always wonder: is are these talking to me in a certain way? And I felt that this one was like, you should keep me around for a little bit. And it came. It became one of those images that was like, I can't let this go. And uh, it felt like a faceless creature wanting to, you know, tell me it's like you should be looking for this. You should be looking for these shapes. So as it goes, uh, let's see. Even with this one in particular, um, I, I always felt it's it's really angular and linear, and there's a lot of bamboo that used to be real things, and the only real things are uh, fenced off and wrapped around and uh, just existing, like they, uh, uh, you know, concrete structures. Just one last point. If you right. go back to I think it's just go up a bit. Uh, that one. Okay, this that one. Yes. This one, I think, this is the way you actually said it was anthropomorphic, where it yeah. took on a something realistic and, and alive. Yes. Because it's so close. I, I felt that it was so... It's such a big... I mean, cranes are not small. They, they lift a lot of weight. They, they move things from place to place with a lot of ease, and it was so close to this, this barrier that's meant to say, stay away. And I felt it was almost like a, a zoo animal, like a, a giraffe looking over the edge. And <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks, Burton. Yim Sui Fong. Um 所以我其实在摄影在我的作品里面都会出现我其实有些次浪人的时候 咁有啲大頭盔嘅,因為呢,我就好驚佢話我撞,即係自己做乜爆個間屋度影相,咁其實冇嘅,咁真係一個方,呃,近期,荒廢咗一個地方啦。咁我點樣搵到呢個地方係
，就諗誒、哎、去睇下咪知咯，係咪先？好多嘢你,你用行動去睇到。咁去到啦，就點知就係一個嘅、呃、合作社嘅樓嚟嘅。咁呢樣嘢咧對我嚟講係好遙遠嘅，因為我除咗公屋、居屋、私樓呢啲認識咧，唔再唔知道香港有呢樣嘢啦。咁、呃、我就影咗好多相咁樣啦，係誒、呃、開頭嘅時候。咁、呃、然後咧過咗一段日子就冇乜點樣嘅，即係我都係咁樣。但係咧就遇到呢、这個、呃、比賽嘅 open call 啦，咁我就諗咦咦點解誒？誒、呃，即係又再睇翻啲相，我覺得咧呢、这個地方好代表過度嘅呢一嘅呢一個回應到呢個主題咧，係有幾樣嘢嘅、呃呃。首先咧就係、是呃、即其實咧我爸個住嗰個皇家廠係我屋區嚟嘅，咁去,去到呢個地方咧、呃、就係、是、一個合作樓啦，咁好代表到一個、呃、即係裏面好多都係咧公務員住咧，佢哋即係有呢個福利去起到呢個樓啦。咁然後裏面佢哋啱啱搬走呢，就就留低咗好多文件啦。誒、呃，不如我哋睇一次先好嘛？有呢啲係誒 document 啦、啊、新聞啦、啊，嘈咗好耐。一九八九年五月三十一號嘅報紙啦，誒一九八六年嘅月曆啦，誒誒誒誒期啦，區期同國期啊。呢個係睡房嘅一個白板嘅 b 啦。咁咧，佢咧就係、是呃、我揾睇翻佢哋房裏面咧，應該二零一六年搬走嘅年年底，而咧呢、这個白板係停留喺二零零八年冇拆過嘅。咁仲有就係、是、誒、呃呃、聖母像，即係其實裏面有好多關於信仰啊、宗教嘅物件啦，有誒好、呃、多剩低嘅個人嘅收藏啦，有啲 figure 啊，好多 slide 嘅，好多一啲以前過往嘅一啲喜好嘅嘢。咁啊誒假牙係啦，我就覺得好似見到個人咁咯，我覺得呢好即係令我好聯繫到一個老人啦。然後咧就呢啲 f i c h e s 啦，就係、是、嗯已經有都係二零一六年全球咧已經停產㗎啦。咁其實裡面仲有好多嘢嘅，就係、是、有啲誒誒做白事嘅時候嘅嗰啲白金寶啊，誒、呃、又係啲呢呢呢個位。呢、这個位係信仰嗰啲嗰啲 c o 車聖經嚟嘅，就叫做 God bless our home、um,。As for me and my family, we serve the Lord 咁樣。咁然後最後呢張相咧就係誒誒，就係佢哋喺窗台，佢哋每人都會有窗台啦，有涼台啦。咁又誒，即係將個祖先嘅照都掉咗，但係咧棵植物咧就成年咧，即係我入去嘅時候已經係荒廢咗一年㗎啦。就生得好誒，好好扭扭零零咁樣，仲喺度生緊咁樣。係啦，咁其實咧，我覺得咧，誒、呃、誒、呃、有誒、呃、入到去咧，俾我嘅感覺就係、是、誒、呃呃、首先咧就好，我覺得好似點解原來合作社呢、这個好好好一個理念啊，即係佢哋起咧係貨為咗住嘅，問政府借錢借地，然後咧好似還關窿咁還翻錢，咁佢哋咧就全部人都識。誒、呃、全誒即係啲啲鄰舍都係合作社呢個公司嘅識嘅，咁佢哋咧就維係住呢個樓嘅營運啊、起啊等等咧，就係淨係貨咗佢哋共住嘅呢樣呢個目的咯，就唔係賣唔可以賣嘅咁樣啦。咁我覺得呢樣理念好好啦。點解誒香誒誒，亦、呃呃呃、都係誒殖民地時候嘅，好似咧會帶嚟咗好多一啲誒、呃、好嘅政策留低咗落嚟咁樣啦。咁第二樣嘢咧，就本身就係呢個地方係、呃、全，其實嗰個係附近都係木屋區，即、就、係、是、我白營住嗰度咧。但係到誒到而家咧，就係、是、合作社之後嘅命運係咩？就會起豪宅嘅喎。咁我又覺得我話點解誒誒官方嘅樓之後亦都係可以變私人，又變咗即係賣地咁啦。即係但係又得好反映到香港而家狀況，好多時候都係、呃、最尾誒誒點樣講咧，都係變咗一個銷售啊私人樓嘅市場咁樣啦。咁第,第三個咧，我覺得、呃呃、最令我 reflect 翻誒過度嘅一樣嘢就係、是、咧，其實我唔係入咗去一次嘅，入咗去幾次嘅，即係第二次啊三次就想用菲林去影啦，因為咧，我覺得菲林嘅質地或者我個我個觸覺會強啲啦。咁我影我去佢每第二第三次去嘅時候，每次嗰啲嘢唔同咗喎，個位又唔同啊，可能有啲嘢俾人拎走咗啊，個衣車又唔見咗啊，或者係底下面啲文件攞攞翻上面啊，好似睇到睇到、呃、一個家庭更多嘅嘢，或者佢哋，但係咧就唔單止呢個家庭，係有好多唔同人參與緊嘅。咁就覺得咧，原來冇咗主人嘅物件啦，依、这個地方係等待去拆嘅呢個過渡中期一個空間啦。誒、呃、係、呃、可以任意俾人去擺佈咯，即係、呃
、呃、去可能去為咗自己利益攞咗啲嘢啊，可能又為、呃呃、去有自己嘅 say 喺裏面啊，自己嘅誒、呃、擺設喺裏面。咁我覺得咧，我好似係影緊呢一個人參與緊呢個狀態嘅一個過程添。然後咧，我亦都好想咧，為咗呢一個我覺得好有理念嘅一個、呃、居住嘅政策咧，去留低一啲誒誒相啦，同埋一啲住腳嘅。因為咧，譬如我之前同阿 John 傾過都係，佢即係我哋譬如睇誒好多新、呃、香港嘅歷史嘅照片啊等等咧，都係睇啲街道啊，以前條街係點樣嘅，起咗咩樓，好少見一個室、呃、一個屋企或者一個室內係點樣嘅。而呢一度咧就即係我去到呢度就好睇到啦，並且覺得係。好近嘅就話，原來誒呢、呃、一種可以細集住嘅一個居住嘅模式咧，佢哋可以累積嘢咯，即係佢哋住嘅地方好大啊，可以累積嘢啊，家庭咧誒誒誒累積到嘅嘢都好反映到當時香港嘅發生緊嘅事啊咁。咁佢佢係幾時開始嘅呢、這個合作社係一九五五十五三年到嘅。而佢哋咧，因為係公務員，所以咧佢保留啲文文件係好整齊嘅，所以都係咁樣翻下翻下之後，哇！原來咁起樓㗎，每人夾一百蚊就，哇！有股份就開始開公司喎，五萬幾蚊咧就問政府借錢分廿年還關窿，就個樓就係佢啦咁樣。咁啊，然後、呃、上網，跟住其實我嘅創作咧，呢、这、一個係一個開始之，我都會有啲 research 去 support 翻，究竟誒呢一種嘅觀察或者發現係啲咩咧？咁我、呃、就會、呃係咁樣，即係創作呢一輯嘅相啦。咁譬如第二樣嘢咧，我就會覺得誒，佢、呃、誒家係啲咩咧？又會係你收藏一啲你喜愛嘅嘢，或者係你啲誒、呃、憂慮嘅嘢，都會係咪先？咁然後佢譬如呢個報紙，佢誒一九八九年都係反映到佢哋誒嗰時誒、呃、六四之前屠城之前嘅嗰個新聞啦。然後咧誒呢個特別想講，因為咧佢嘅 headline 裏面咧都好似而家咧不斷 repeat 緊嘅啲歷史咁喎，例如。第一句咧就話、呃、行政長官應該大約呢二、呃、即係、呃、要直選，要二零零三年之後普選到嘅咁樣啦，喺個臨時立法會嗰度即刻討論呢樣嘢啦。然後咧誒，咁、呃、我就覺得哇，原來我哋真係、呃、即係追求，即係要求咗咁多年嘅咯喎，係好好真實啊嗰、那個歷史即刻變得。呃、然後又係啲誒船民啦，越南船民啦，而家都係好歐洲又多難民啦。然後咧有啲學生運動咧、呃，都係唔係即係呢啲社會運動都係由學生去,、呃、去,去先開發出嚟，即係先推推行出嚟啦。咁我覺得點解誒好多時候呢啲、呃、社會嗰啲、呃、理念啊，呃、即係點講想政府、呃、想個社會更好嘅一啲、呃呃、行動啊，都係由學生去推行出嚟嘅咧咁樣。咁呢啲就係一九八六年佢哋，我覺得可能代表一啲 desire 啦，喺閲歷裏面嘅。誒、呃、呢、這個係誒、呃、區旗啦，然後咁啱啲風啊吹咗一支旗落地下啦，跟住咧誒個上面嘅報紙就係講緊誒啲樓市嘅，呢啲好 daily 嘅，即係好似哦睇報紙，即係就會反映到佢哋平時嗰啲 preference 咁樣。誒係啦，呢、呃這個日歷啦。哦，咁我就開始咧喺個 caption 度咧幫佢寫故仔，因為我都好想幫佢咧組成一個我閲讀呢度地方嘅，因為人人呢、这個過渡期啊嘛，人人都可以俾佢個注意，係咪？咁我都會俾個注意啦。就譬如呢個咧，佢停喺二零零八年，我就諗啊，當年 iPhone 出喎、哦，佢哋咁有錢，咁一定係轉咗 smartphone 啦，咁又反映到可能時代一啲嘢啦。咁、呃、因為佢仲要寫星期一、星期二、星期三、星期四做咩咁樣？咁然後誒係啦，又有誒佢哋佢哋嗯，即係譬如一啲信仰咧，一啲好珍貴嘅嘢啦，擺屋企，但係都會有捨棄或者斷嚟嘅一日啦。誒、呃，佢哋喜愛嘅 object 咧，好反映到佢哋係幾代人一齊住啦，唔單止係即係剩一個年紀嘅。誒、呃，仲有老人家啦，頭先講。誒、呃、咁其實呢，仲有好多呢關於影像嘅斷離嘅喎，例如二零一即係譬如 VHS 已經唔再睇啦，嗰時係實時錄、實時播、呃、即係實時要錄，要等，然後 rewind 嗰種觀睇睇嘢嘅方法呢，到而家都好似有啲距離。咁我就好似睇緊一個時代或者香港啦，再裏面啲大呢，好多係日本啦、美國嘅 pop culture 啦、香港啲寫啲英雄傳啦、粵語片嘅影響啦。咁、嗯、啊，見到誒、呃、當年嗰、那個、呃、香港嘅 pop 歌場係點樣、呃、影響住誒、呃，即係係啦呢啲有呢啲人咁咯。咁最尾其實咧、呃、我點樣鋪排呢啲相咧？最後呢張即係第一張相咧，咪五三即係五十年代佢哋啲組即係第一代嘅人開始起樓啦。
。咁我想點解會掉咗嗰個祖先嗰個相嘅呢？有可能我就喺度聯想係、呃、可能佢哋搬個地方已經冇神主台噶，又或者咧，可能呢個人就喺呢棟樓嘅其中一個人，或者係佢阿爸阿媽。誒、呃、父母或者阿爺咁啦，但因為咁多代五十年之後，可能咧而家佢哋住緊嘅人咧，已經覺得同佢係冇關嘅啦，冇關或者已經遠離嘅嘢，咪可以即係可能可以留低咁啦。咁咧，但係咧最強烈嘅對照就係呢個植物咧，佢係即係雖然都係俾人哋唔要啊，遺棄遺棄啊咁樣啦，但係佢咧自己係會繼續生咧，即係冇水，即係點咧，好似生子不得都會繼續生咯。所以我覺得呢、這個、呃、人嘅一個斷捨啊，同埋。誒、呃、誒、呃、植植物就即係好似 Burton 頭先講過咧，你將第一張相嗰啲水嗰啲，即係呢個大自然係仍然係唔會因為人而去改變，繼續咁，即係有少少咁嘅感感感感想咁啦。咁就我咁樣鋪排啲相，同埋影咗呢輯，就希望講緊即係都覺得好反映到香港過度嘅一個政策啦，主要嘅政策同埋誒誒人嘅活動喺裏面咁樣。Uh, thanks, uh, Sui Fong. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. So you said you went to the this building because your father lived in a, a squatter area. So this building replaced that building of your father. How conscious were you of his presence? Or the presence of that time. Uh, could you explain that a little bit? And like this particular photo photograph, I find quite moving because um, it, it's an ancestor photograph. But there's renewal, there's growth, there's there's life there as well. So did did you maybe you just talk a little bit about the, the initial reason you went there and your initial feelings? 誒、呃、開頭去其實純粹真係好奇，想啊，即係啊會住過啲咩地方？因為嗰個地方係黃家廠係即係親戚都會成日講啊，咁佢哋用客佢哋講客家話又話嗰啲，他成日講嗰個即係出於好奇啦。咁、呃、所以去到嘅時候誒、呃、雖然 replace 咗或者已經變咗樓，但係咧我好似睇翻譬如就係啲 pop culture 啊，以前嗰啲話誒粵語片。即係嗰啲嗰啲嘢咧，我覺得哦，我爸原來最 active 嘅時候就係嗰個嘅環境啦。香港都幾富足嘅喎，或者係可能因為佢屋企人有錢啦。咁但係譬如、呃、我又覺得哇，我好似睇到一個張嘢，一個過程、呃、原來香港係誒咁，即係其中嘅即係咁樣慢慢有個城市有咁嘅質地咁樣，即係咁樣嘅生活嘅。嘅嘅狀況落咗嚟咁，所以我覺得誒、呃，我唔係一個懷舊嘅人其實，但係去到嘅時候咧，就非常之興奮，即係覺得好似咧誒誒，好似好似好啲人好近啦，哇 ！fit fit fit 啲啲啲影像閃過，好似有啲聲，即係聽到咁啊！原來香港以前係咁咁樣咯，就好似一個誒、呃、家庭嘅妙思人，但係又誒、呃，即係我我嗰刻唔知點解覺得哇，香港好近咁咯，即係。尤其是係誒抗爭嗰啲嘅歷史原則咯，咁長遠咁樣。And one question I have about your installation in the Central Library,、uh, I, I presume most of you have seen it. So it's actually very different feeling from just the photographs on the screen. You have a vase. Can you tell us a little bit about the vase and the projection? That you and why you did that? Uh, 其實我咧喺 Central Library 咧就有三個 project， 四個 projection 嘅。咁一個係一個光，一個係一個呢啲影像嘅嘅大嘅 projection。咁咧就係廿秒到一張嘅好慢嘅。咁另一個 projection 咧就係呢啲影像嘅 close up 啦，想大家誒、呃、留意翻啲細部咁樣。然後咧就仲有一個 projection 係唔喐嘅，係一棵植物嚟嘅。但係嗰個植物咧就係、是。抱著埋一個，即係、那個嗰、那個嗰、那個樽咧，就係喺度咁樣啦。但係上面冇植物嘅，就抱著一個植物落去咁樣啦。咁我其實咧覺得咧，誒、呃
誒、呃，譬如我呢輯相咧，都你睇埋 caption 咧，會好多歷史喺裏面嘅，即係好似一啲 fact 咁樣嘅。但其實咧有我嘅寫落去啦，咁假假地又真真地，咁<笑>其實好真嘅，非常之真嘅嘢去寫。咁咧，我覺得呢啲都可能好似感覺上好似誒實啲、硬啲咁。咁咧，因為我最尾呢個我真係覺得植物咧，好係、呃、一個誒，好、呃、好有感覺啦，即係我唔知點講添啊，即係即係呢棵植物。所有嘢都寫起嘅時候，佢可以即係仲繼續、呃、生長，即係好似原諒咗人添咁樣咁樣。咁所以我就好想擺棵植物喺個空間裏面咧，作為一個、呃、一個虛啲嘅一個聯想嘅位咁咯，係啦，即係啲逝去嘅、存在嘅、仲生長嘅或者係嘅嘢。嗯So Fong, that was lovely.、Um, Ian, maybe someone could change this while I talk. Yeah.、Um, I, is there anyone wants to come in the door? Now's a good chance to come and get a seat. You know. <laughs>、um, yeah. Th- can we? Yeah, okay.、Um, it, it's very difficult to uh, explain um, my my take on transition because I, I think you you have to look at the context I started from, and that's in 1977. I came here、uh, to work for the Hong Kong government as an agent of change. We had to change things because the human condition. Was so bad that we were in a stage of almost desperation, and I have a real problem because I, it was only when I was talking to John about tonight that I realised that there are probably no people in the audience, or very few, who know what it was like in Hong Kong in 1977. Is there anyone here that was in Hong Kong in 1971? Two, three, right. And I don't know what your memories are of Hong Kong, but. What I've tried to do is take、um, some themes,、um, which I've also written in, which is in this in this book on transitions, and, and I'll relate to you、uh, the impression. And, and I've tried to get a before and after situation, and、um, it's all about the changing human condition and what we are doing as as planners and even as people that live here. We're we're changing this place, and. It's very difficult to、um, look at it. I mean, put it another way. I look at it from a big level in what I'm doing here. This is a, a, a macro level. But the beauty of being in Hong Kong is that you can actually walk around places where you've known for a long time, and you can come up with the knowledge of how this change has taken place. So, this is the squat area in Shaoqi Wan. And you can imagine that very large areas of Hong Kong Island and, and、um, Kowloon were covered like this. And this is now the place where Yu Tong Estate is located. So you can see the transition from what is a very organic, natural desperation of how do we find a home and how do we create a home. And, and th- th- this. Totally amazed me. Whenever I had a planner from New Zealand, where we came from, our green grass, our hills, and our, our beautiful little houses, we're sitting on little yards and everything, totally structured, to come to a situation like this, and see what people were living in. And something that always amazed everyone I took there was the fact that when the children left these squatter huts to go to school. They were all wearing white uniforms, which were absolutely, totally sparkling white. And that, that all, you know, that plus all the the fact that everyone had a TV, or a lot of people had TVs. Everyone had electricity, but they didn't have water supply and they didn't have toilets.、Mm-hmm. And this is the area of Kennedy Town. You know, all of these don't exist anymore. And this was absolutely fantastic. Look at look at these ones down the bottom. The bottom area here, where they're on stilts, out over the over the harbour, 
And if you go to this area, you can see where these people lived. Now, the platforms, some of those platforms are still there. But none of the people, none of those. And there were real communities. You know, they looked after each other. There were problems always of fire, right? Now, this is the first planning area that I worked in. And it's, um, it was Kowloon City, Wang Tai Sin. And what we were doing was trying to provide people with permanent housing so that when there's a typhoon or a rainstorm or a fire, they weren't subject to this incredible risk of, 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 of death or damage or complete loss of everything that they own. And one of the things that the, the first public housing uh, estates did, they were a reaction to a large fire around Christmas in Shekhar Bay. And we came to a stage of creating public housing. This is uh, an area which I'll never forget. It's actually one of the things that was happening about the same time is we were building the MTR. And this is where the Diamond Hill MTR station is now located. Right? The, the buildings in the background are the Sampo Kong industrial buildings. And there is a relationship between the factories which are... I can't get out. There's none. Okay. But this, the factories in the foreground here are... We're in the worst state of um, pollution that you could ever imagine. They were generating pollution in terms of noise, um, the, the air pollution. There were no um, standards of environmental quality. And most of the, um, the waste was just let to run on the streets, into the streams. And, you know, that, I, I worked in Chunwan, and, and there's a uh, Chunwan dyeing factory there. And the color of Chunwan Bay was determined completely by the color of the dye that was in the dyeing factory at the time. You may remember that, but sometimes you'd go past and it's a dark blue, and the next time you go past it's a light blue, and the next time it's orange. And this is the whole of Chunwan Bay, because everything just went straight into it. But, but these industrial factories here provided uh, a link to the factories in the big buildings. And we all of these factories, if you walk through these these alleys, you'd see where they're producing plastic things, they're producing metal things, which were then provided to the people up in the, the bigger factories as part of the process. This is what I came to in terms of public housing. It's a Mark I public housing estate, and they were absolutely incredible in lots of ways. Um, on the top, you see the schools, um, you see six or eight stories of residential development, there are no, there's a central partition down the middle of these blocks, down the middle of the block, and there's a unit on one side and a unit on the other side, and they're connected for ventilation. There is a, a ventilation hole between the two flats, which is always an area of, of complaint because if the people on the other side didn't open it, there's no ventilation, but if they did open it, then you get all the noise and everything that's happening on both sides. The, the units were probably as wide as this, probably from where the translation lady is sitting to here, and that would be a family of four to six people. No kitchens, the kitchens uh, were outside on this balcony, no commu uh, communal toilets and showers, and the playgrounds and the social entities, everything took part at ground level. And this is where the community, everything took place on the street. And Ever since this time, the Hong Kong government has tried to tidy up the street level. So we lose this street environment, the community environment, the place where people meet and mix and so on. And so again, even though this is there, we went through a process of ch change. And here we are, the Mark IV, which is what we were building. And these were a massive improvement because they, they had their facilities within the, in the flat. And now we go to 40-story buildings like you were talking about to mention. So this is the progression and transition and the changes that are taking place. You see on the ground floor, I don't know if you can see very well now, but now we've got landscaped areas and so on. And so we're starting to get proper school buildings, proper community facilities. Now the MTR was absolutely incredible in the way that it changed the whole of this relationship of the city. Um, for instance, when the MTR got to Quintong, 
Before that time, every night and day, there were huge queues to get on the ferry from Central to Kuntong, or from North Point to Kuntong. These were the only ways you could get across. And as soon as the MTR came in, then the ferry services dropped. And the whole focus of the, of the city went from, from the waterfront ferry terminals to the MTR stations. And, and this is, uh, IFC is one of my projects, and it, it, it's an absolutely fantastic project. You know, this is something that uh, we've created on reclamation. We have an airport linked to the, um, the an express line linked to the airport, plus all of the other lines linking into it. And so we have this fantastic um, space that was created with so many different functions all together. And that is an amazing transition from the, you know, the, the squatter hut side to this side. Another thing which was really significant, and, and this is a photo looking across the Kowloon Peninsula. Um, when the airport, before the airport was moved, there were restrictions across most of Kowloon and a lot of some parts of uh, Hong Kong Island, such as um, Taikushin, uh, which restricted the development to the height of these lower buildings. And then when the airport was moved, the height restriction was changed. And the whole of the, um, the landscape, the vertical landscape has changed. And this is a really good photo, I think, because it shows what was there before and what's, what is able to take place now. So we're going from a more horizontal, dense city to one where we're able to go higher and create more space at the ground level. And, and this is uh, someone, Richard Wong, this was on the internet, and I think it's a really, really great photo. If you look at the top one, um, this is uh, Kings Park in Southern Kowloon. They're, they're very similar locations. And this half shows you what it was like in the 50s. And, and then this one is in 2009. And that's, that's the transition that's taken place in that period of time. Now, if I go back to coming here in the, around 1980, after the time I finished my first two years, two and a half years here, I went back to New Zealand, I couldn't see any change at all, right? And then I come back to Hong Kong and already things that I've been working on were changing. And then another 10 years I go back to New Zealand, nothing's changed, right? And then you come back here and we're, we're heading towards the IFC situation. So the speed of transition is absolutely rem remarkable. And one of the things that assists that is the fact that Hong Kong government has so much money it can spend money on infrastructure and it should be spending more money on, on welfare and the quality of the environment that we're trying to create. Now, <clears throat> I worked in, uh, in Tin Soi Wai. Um, this is my, uh, my main new town uh, that I worked in, in Yunlong District. And when I went there, um, this whole area here is fish ponds. Right? This has been partly filled in. And what happened is, is this, this was owned by one family. And they sold it to a Chinese company, uh, which, which had government support. And they came to the Hong Kong government and said, we're going to build a new town on here. And it's really interesting to go back because I was able to look at some of the executive council papers from that time. And the idea was we've got to tie Hong Kong, the Chinese government into something in Hong Kong which is going to see us through the transition. So the decision to do a new town here was not only prompted by the fact that we needed more accommodation, but also there was a political component to it. And this is what we've got. And, and that is a massive transition from that, right? So the same area there, has transformed to that. And uh, it was great to be part of that. We did the design of this in six months. Um, we didn't do any ecological impact assessment because ecology didn't matter. Um, at that time, no, I mean, I mean at, at that time, the priorities were so great because if you look at the Shakiwan and the other squatter areas that I've shown you, it's the human conditions are important. We have to get people out of that into something like this. And the quality of the environment that they'd be living, the quality of the housing is so much better than where they were. And this is the priority. So 50% of the development was for public housing and 50% was for private housing. And what happened is because of the allocation system, 
people could jump the queue, jump the waiting queue. And you could wait for five years to get a flat in Kowloon, or you could get one next month in Tinsoi Wai. And the people that were the lowest level on the, on the waiting list were generally the poorer people uh, with less um, time in Hong Kong. And, and, and that whole um, period of pre how long you've been, if you're seven years, then you get on the list, right? Um, wow, that's it. Is it? Yeah. So, so those are the sorts of levels of transition that we can see. I mean, I could go on for ages, but um, I think the important thing that I got out of it when, when it has to do this was it's not necessarily the physical things that have created the need for the transition. It's this human condition. And, and I will always come back to this as whenever people talk about we have a critical housing problem at the moment. We don't. This was a critical housing problem. We're, we're talking now about quality of life things rather than uh, the necessities of life. And it's a matter of how much you want to um, sacrifice in some ways the public um, advantages in terms of improving a person's private uh, living environment beyond that which is a basic requirement. So we now have 45% of all the households in Hong Kong living in public housing or subsidized housing. So most of those people, all of those people are classified as being adequately housed. So to me, this is the problem that we managed to solve. And we finished up with creating a, a wonderful city which you can, you can see in the, uh, the IFC. This is uh, so different from where it else we became. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Yes, not, not quite yet. We've got a little bit longer to go. And um, I want to ask Ian something. I was challenged the other day when I went to a, a, a film uh, which was hosted by SOCO, the Society for Community Organization. And I was introduced to a housing activist. And they said I was a... Um, a, a, a the convener of the Central and Western Concern Group. Um, and he looked at me and said, Ah, you're conservative. And what he meant by that was because some of us uh, discuss issues about Hong Kong's past, particularly its cultural heritage, its built heritage, and as Ian just mentioned, lifestyle, We've got an activist saying, hang on, it is really urgent for us to build more housing and, and bugger heritage. And, and certain um, processes that we have in place now, um, you know, some people want to actually uh, bypass those processes like an envir environmental impact studies. And I heard Ian on the radio uh, last week when he was talking about Fangling Golf Course and he made a very interesting comment that okay, if we are going to consider Fangling Golf Course for housing, you do it the proper way, you do the planning for it and that can take many years to do with all the studies you need to do and, and put in the transport infrastructure but actually I want to ask Ian your, your, your photograph of Kowloon Peninsula, which is a fabulous photograph because it's exactly right. The planes were coming in, there were no high-rise houses above, what, seven, seven storeys or eleven storeys. And, of course, now the whole Kowloon Peninsula could be built. It's all very well saying we have a, a tall building here with lots of air around it. But if they're all damn tall buildings, then no one has any air. So, Ian... If someone said to you, you're conservative when you say, hey, we've got to put in the planning processes, what would your reply be? Uh, okay. I, I think SoCo have got it right. Um, we, we have about 125,000 households living in uh, inadequate housing. And they get no priority when it comes to allocating public housing. 
Uh, we, we're not giving the people who inadequately house housing. We're giving housing to people who are adequately housed, and there's a definition but it, it, of what adequate housing is. And those that are inadequately housed should not be living in those situations. But our public housing is being allocated as priority to the people who are already living in good private um, sector housing, but on an affordability, they're giving them public housing because the, the system that they have for, for creating these waiting lists for public housing for home ownership schemes is completely unfair. It gives more people uh, an opportunity to get onto a four to seven year waiting list than they're ever going to produce flats for. So if you can't, if someone's living in a reasonable flat, let them live there, give them some sort of voucher or something to allow them to live there and give the housing to those that really need it, which are those in the subdivided flats and, and temporary structures and so on. And, and so if you look at this photograph, and it, it's happened, um, you know, e even when I was in Chunwan in the 70s and 80s, subdivided flats were a common part of the housing. It was something that was available for people to move into. Um, and then we moved into a better quality of housing. So we should, like we got rid of all the squatter huts. What happened when, when someone became eligible for, for housing and they were living in a squatter hut, when they moved out of the squatter hut, the squatter control section would come and demolish the building so that no one else could live in it. And we progressively rehoused those people from inadequate housing to adequate housing. And we removed the inadequate housing so there couldn't be a, an ongoing process. And, and we need to do something now. There's nothing about being conservative. It's just about putting in place the, the proper systems. And, and regarding the Fanling Golf Course, it's miles from anywhere at the moment. It's got no roads, no services or anything. We've got lots of other areas that are being properly planned. Let's do those first. And, and we should be focusing on Hong Soi Kyu and places like this where we have all the infrastructure planned, but we don't have the money and the priority at the moment. Um, thanks, Ian. So we're going to come back to, to Ian again and everyone, but I thought I'd like to just open up for any discussion, for any of you who wants to, to say something, because one of my interests is... You've heard Ian and how we go through uh, change, uh, urban planning changes from very inadequate conditions to, to, to much better conditions. We've looked at Yim Sui Fong and her discovery of, of, a, of the sense of her father in um, an old building. And then Burton has looked at the 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 strange little things we see in Hong Kong during the process of change, where scaffolding's put up and um, panelling is put up and fences are put up and these strange interventions. And I wonder how this affects Hong Kong, being Hong Kong. When you wanting to, when, when you want to define, your, define yourself, when you say, I am a Hong Konger, is it the urban landscape that is assisting you and helping you to say why you are a Hong Konger? Is it actually affecting you? Uh, I mean, Ian's point about in the 50s and 60s and 70s when the, the, the streets were the playgrounds for everyone and this ground floor area was so full of people and you go to a housing estate now and it, it's just really old people sitting, sitting there. You know, how does that affect? Like, when you were growing up, how does that affect, how did it affect you? And how is the changes, if we've got the Tin Sui Wai example, where no one is on the ground floor. In fact, the ground floor, we try and discourage people. So I, I, I just wonder if, if, we, if anyone wants to make a comment at this point. Yeah, at the back. We need to use the microphone so it's caught on the, on the video. Okay, I came in Hong Kong in 1974, <clears throat> and uh, 
and I live with the Yamati boat people for 10 years at the time, so um, <coughs> uh, I saw uh, what happened in Hong Kong at those times, uh, even uh, how the squatter people were uh, moved from the squatter area into the Vietnamese refugees camp first, in tens of thousands, and then into the housing uh, prepared by the housing department, housing authority. <coughs> We fought not to go to the new territories at the time. Perhaps I was also an activist at the time. <laughs> and we were, we were also arrested by Hong Kong government in 1979 while going with the Amatebo people to present a petition to the uh, governor. Just uh, we were arrested on the buses to go there uh, in, in, in uh, 7th of uh, January, 1979. Of course, there was a very big uh, change in Hong Kong, but uh, <coughs> uh, I don't think that uh, Hong Kong, the last picture of Hong Kong, is a successful picture. Uh, because uh, this one, uh, I think uh, because there is also, also a mentality that uh, huge buildings, tall buildings, represent the uh, modernity. To be modern, we have to go. Uh, on <laughs> high places, so because uh, uh, I think that the, the housing uh, estates were built not be, uh, not only because uh, people had to be rehoused, but because the uh, capitalist soci society in Kong needed people uh, living near the working places when Hong Kong was uh, was uh, a factory uh, society. Uh, I hope that <laughs> you as a plan manager, uh, is it possible to think another way to build housing in Hong Kong? A way that is uh, like our countries, New Zealand, I am from Italy or uh, uh, even China, I don't know. So, um, why don't we go horizontally, not vertically? <laughs> because people are really, I don't know why people buy their, their the flats now in this, I, I'm living also in a, in, in a housing estate on the 19th floor. There are 34 floors, but nobody uh, know, knows each other. Perhaps at that time I was living in, a, in a Diamond Hill, in the squatter area, and uh, the, the relationship was much uh, closer. Must, uh, <laughs> so is it possible for now for the housing authority or home government to think to go more horizontally, because uh, Oco Oco Hong Kong has not so much land, but uh, why there are so many villages abandoned in the new territories? Why don't try to develop in this way? And even if Hong Kong there is no enough land, why don't we think to think of China? You said Hong Kong, we are a Hong Konger. Huh? So why don't try with Saint Chen or other places to go horizontally, that people are, have a normal life, so uh, and not to always to take lifts. Now it's also dangerous. Yeah, sometimes the lifts uh, uh, to to live in that kind of. Uh, uh, I think uh, so. Uh, I don't. <laughs> okay, is it possible uh, for? Uh, okay. uh, just a quick response. All right. It's not possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, to give you the opposite, I, I go back to Auckland, New Zealand, which has got a population of uh, about a million, right? One-seventh of Hong Kong. And it's got an area of about the same size. And everyone is spread across in one or two-story houses. It's the <coughs> biggest waste of land. And every time I go back, I think, what a terrible way to build a city. Nothing works, you know, nothing is economic. They, they have no transport system, they have expensive uh, costs on servicing, or water supply, everything. Nothing works. And one of the things that I, I think that we can be proud of in Hong Kong is that everything basically works. We, like, you know, you go to Manila, it doesn't work, you know. Uh, you go to, Thai, um, to Thailand, Bangkok, it, it doesn't really work. There's always a problem. But in Hong Kong, I think the way that we do things, it works. And I personally don't have a problem with 
tall buildings. It's a question perhaps of how tall should we go to make it a good living environment. And personally, I think 30 to 40 stories is about right. Uh, but if you go up to residential developments and 60 stories, I think it's just crazy. But, uh, so, th so that's a simple answer. Yeah, um, Sui Fong, why don't you try and answer that in Cantonese? Ko 去起然后去不是为坏的不是去卖的是去居住这个这样的可以营造一个社区大家有认识跟住呢样东西好像我们轮舍这样东西好像有没有这样东西都没有这样东西 Uh, yes, um, my name is Wilson. I, I, was, I was born in Hong Kong, so for 59 years I was in Hong Kong, so I can say something about Hong Kong. First of all, right, I used to live in Hock Si Thoi, okay? Uh, at that time, there's only four storage. So right now, right, Hock Si Thoi got a, a high-rise building right there. There's a, 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 around, I, I, I don't know, it's around 40-some floor. So Hong Kong have no, uh, we have no chance to have a, a flat uh, housing because uh, the land in, in our place is too expensive. Second of all, right, I found Hong Kong right now, we have a problem because the pouring about the mainland China for the immigration, they come 150, it's a 150 per, per daily. And second of all, right, I found out, uh, recently I found out they have the, a lot of students from mainland China, they come over to Hong Kong as well. It's at, at least around, uh, 15,000 to They can stay in Hong Kong for one year. Afterward, if they stay seven years, they become Hong Kongese. So right now, we have a lot of Hong Kongese. It's not our own Hong Kong people. But actually, those people have a very high qualifications. And some of them, right, they even have a very solid background. That's why the speculations about the Hong Kong land is so expensive, one of the things. Second of all, right, I found out uh, uh, one of the things about Hong Kong, I don't like it, okay, actually, is they torn down a lot of old buildings and our old memories. For example, if you go to Shanghai, if you go to the Ban area, you can see a lot of historical things still intact. Okay, even the, uh, the outside appearance is, is, uh, is still like, a, a, like six, uh, a century ago, but the inside is quite modern. But Hong Kong, they just torn down everything. Okay, so some of our history is gone. For example, recently the Tinsing, uh, Tinsing Matao. Okay, we 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 lost our what a part of our memories. For me, as a Hong Kongese, my memories is very funny. Okay, my memories as a youth, as a as a kid, is all the bugs, the insects. Okay, uh, we have uh, many many people don't know Hong Kong has a kind of water jar. Okay, when we are young, this is the this is the best toy we can have. So you got that, the water bug. Uh, it's on, only on the lamp pole, okay? We, we actually, we caught them in the, under the lamp pole. It's all gone right now. Because uh, Hong Kong, uh, because of the mosquito, the government spread all the uh, pests, uh, they kill all the insects. So they kill everything, okay? All the species is gone, okay? So we lost a lot of plants. Right now, Hong Kong kids are different than our generation. Used to be, we, we go downstairs, we play. So we have a gang, like 20 people, we play hide and seek. It's very enjoy, okay? But right now, I found out because of the internet, they doesn't want to go outside anymore, okay? And, and I found out Hong Kong right now, the new towns, what we have right now. If you go to, few things, right? If you go to Tin Sui Wai, I found one very strange thing. Everybody speaking Mandarin. 
Okay, a lot of people speak in Mandarin around our areas. So a lot, I, I, I presume a lot immigrated uh, from mainland, they live in Tinsova as well. So Hong Kong is not the Hong Kong it used to be. Okay, so we have a very big transaction, I mean, uh, tran a change, okay. It's changing so fast. Actually, right, after this 20 years, okay, after we pass the sovereignties, it changed so fast, okay. Uh, I, I think that it, it is a kind of things that I, I need to remind everybody, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think what we might do now is play Yim Sui Fong's video because I think it touches on some of the comments that you've made and it's about seven minutes long and um, would you like to introduce it? Just like 30 seconds? Uh,咁呢個呢個片呢就叫做黑料島啊,即係對艾倫啦。咁就係我呢,呃,上年就,呃,因為香港回歸廿週年嘛。咁我就對鴿去興趣喎。呃,因為我係北京生活過,就聽
先后发出红色同黑色暴雨警告信号。子同女孩分別喺度等，等長大啦。Okay, thank you. That might explain why... Well, explains many things. Um, what I'd like to do also is to show some of Burton's other work. Um, and I think his, his other work it has a completely different feel from the images that are at, in, in the central library. Burton, would you like to yeah. to show show them? Yeah. I'd just like to make a comment on the video of what you're setting up. Um, I, I think it, it's typical of Hong Kong people that they only obey laws that are sensible. And it fa always fascinates me when you see a sign that says, do not feed the pigeons, right? And you look down there and some, usually an old person's put a whole pile of food down so all the pigeons can eat, right? And there's this, this um, e even when we live in high-rise buildings, there's a relationship between nature. Yeah, like, you know, people grow trees and, and plants in really strange places on buildings just because they want to have this contact with nature. And I, and, and I really think that photograph of the birds all crowding around eating, like, I go past Craig and Gower Cricket Club regularly on a tram or something, and there's always 50, 60, 100 birds there eating food that should not be put down. And I think, great, that's a really good idea. I, I, maybe I should, we should have talked a little bit about her video, but I, I think it's very obvious why she did the video and the implication of pigeons and the changes in the last 20 years. And um, in fact, the, the pigeons are everywhere now. You know, they, they do stay. 
They're, they're in Wan Chai, they're in Causeway Bay, they're in Wong Chuk Hung. <clears throat> and strangely, before 1997, I don't remember pigeons in Hong Kong. Where were they? No, no. I don't remember the pigeons before 1997. Yeah. So I think they all they were all brought here for the handover, and they were supposed to fly back, but the storm interfered. Yeah. Okay, Burton, please. They're illegal immigrants, right? My eyes. Okay. Uh, there's uh, two bodies of work that are kind of uh, mixed up in here. So uh, this one is from something I called uh, Urban Safari. And it's something that I... Uh, it was... Basically, I was interested in these dioramas because you don't get to see a lot of dioramas in Hong Kong. And so on these trips that I did in the U.S., I started to think of the... Uh, I started to see these as... Uh, trips into the territories wherever they are and un basically uh, experiences that I probably will not have firsthand and they're designed to be uh, uh, illustrations like uh, uh, sculptures uh, models of what these creatures look like and they started off um, uh, in France, I think, before, but uh, they're in the Museum of Natural History in New York. Uh, they were uh, a thing that um, it was supposed to be a conservatory uh, movement that Teddy Roosevelt tried to do, uh, one of the foreign presidents. So um, it was, so I basically uh, was watching these and it was uh, kind of a study of uh, faux animals in their, in their landscapes. Now this is the other, uh, this is the weird intermingle because they happened in a weird time. So this one is uh, another project I did as well called uh, Secret Gardens. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at it. But it was basically, I was uh, interested in this, uh, this photographic uh, style at the time, something called tilt shift, which is basically uh, a way to change the film plane to make uh, images appear uh, smaller than they, uh, than they are. So people and objects uh, change scale. So it's basically, in the, the similarities between the two, I think, are really about uh, perception and really about how you, uh, what is uh, infer, you know, I guess, uh, scene reality and what is uh, created reality. So I'll just flip through them and uh, see what we have. And, uh, you see how the scale changes? Hong, Hong Kong? Uh, yeah, so a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these are basically in Hong Kong. Uh, I shot them uh, across, I don't know how many days I shot, but. Just wherever I could, you know, have vantage points that Just provided run, run them. through a few of yeah. them. Yeah. So it's it's making the scenery look like models. Yeah. Yeah. It's romanticizing. It cl it, like it doesn't seem to be dirty. It doesn't seem to be a real landscape. There's no people in them. Yes, yeah, so it's got that uh, this this uh, surreal. Surrealism to it, like a video game, uh, isometrics, if you will, like a planned view, like what we normally wouldn't see if we didn't skew the image. It's a nice one of Happy Valley, I think. And this is going back to the uh, Urban Safari, so this is also one from the Museum of Natural History. So these are a little bit similar, aren't they? You go back to the to the first one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to, no, to no, go to back to the these images. And yeah. Then, you know, they're, they're sort of like a, a stage set. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And a diorama is, is a, a painted backdrop with some, in, the, in these cases, these are stuffed animals. Yeah. 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 In the foreground, and this glass. So it makes it like 3D. Yeah. It's yeah. so almost like an aquarium in a way. And these are massive. These things are the size of this room. They're lit. Uh, 
you have this feeling of, of looking into a world that's uh, definitely surreal and definitely you, you're almost like you you can go in and out of it at will. That's all of them. Yeah. As I, I mean, I picked a lot of them, but yeah. yeah. The we back. have a question at the back. Yeah. Oh, well, after you, um, after all your slides. And, uh, no, no, please. No, sir. Uh, uh, this, uh, I'm very curious to know one thing from Ian. Because just then you mentioned uh, in the seventh, 1970s, we came to Hong Kong, and at that time. The Hong Kong government already has the insight to improve the conditions, the housing conditions in Hong Kong. Because uh, everybody knows that uh, the, there are two very big influx of refugees since uh, 19, 1949 and another time in 1967, the Cultural Revolution. So at that time, the housing conditions in Hong Kong are terrible. So uh, we've seen in slides that there are a lot of the squatters that really need to be uh, teared down. So I could understand that uh, uh, those works need to be done. But I would like to know very much that uh, if the Hong Kong government at that time would also have the vision about urban planning in, say, for example, central, I mean, the developed areas in Hong Kong. Because why I have this question is, just as this gentleman mentioned the loss of the, how, uh, the Queen's Pier. But then you know that uh, at the Pater Street, the old Hong Kong post office, that very beautiful Edwardian building that has torn down in the 1970s. I would know what's the government's vision on the urban plan at that time regarding those old buildings, the preservation concept, and why would they let it to be torn down? Uh, just to make money or what? I, I think. Um To me, I, I mean, it's it's really difficult to try to look back on things, but um, and you'll remember as well that uh, in that period where things were quite desperate uh, in terms of housing conditions, there was a general consensus in the community that we had to do something to help people who were in a worse situation, and it was a very bad situation. So it was like we were able to. Um, as a community say this is what needs to be done and and with Maclehose as governor he said we have to have a housing program and we have to build new towns and really no one objected to that as a principle um, so the new, the idea of building Sha Tin and so on was accepted as something that needed to be done quickly because we had to care the squatters and we had to help people but when we come to looking at the urban area I don't think there was a, uh, a general community concern, right? Um, for instance, um, the, the old post office building, which was actually gone before I got here, but uh, another one like the Hong Kong Club building, the old Hong Kong Club building, I don't think the general community c cared about that because it was a, an elite club building, right? And sure, we lost it, but at the same time, no one really cared. But I think the real changing point was um, the Star Ferry Terminal. And you say, did we have planning at that time? Sure, we had planning. We had plans to, at one stage before the Society for the Protection of the Harbour took action, Hong Kong Harbour was going to be reduced to one kilometre wide from western to eastern. And that was generally accepted in planning terms as being a good thing. And this is what we should do by the government, by the, the people that were working uh, above me particularly. But when we get to the stage of the Society of Protection Harbour suddenly thinking we've got to protect our harbour, that's a natural resource, it's a community asset. And then by the time they did that, the decision to reclaim in front of the old Staff Area and City Hall had already been made and it was very difficult to stop it. And if 
you know, that to me, that star theory um, objection and the, the fact that Holoy and other people got re got uh, arrested and all the rest of it, that was the beginning of the general awakening of the of what I'd say the local community or the gr grassroots level or the student level that we have to do something to protect important things that we relate to in the city. And um, I, I don't think until that started to happen, like it, it'll always be in my memory. Um, Michael Soon, I think, was the secretary for development at the time, or, or regional out, and they refused to meet people at the Star Ferry. And the, the, the objection had been going on for weeks, and there were people and protesting there. And then Rita Lau was moved, and Carrie Lam became the Secretary for Development. And one of the first things she did in a very hot day was spend a day with the protesters down at the Star Ferry in the City Hall, Queen's Pier. And, and that, was, that was, to me, the beginning of the fact that we actually have to take care of some of these things. And then, you know, if, if you look at the, the transition from that through to what we were doing with um, the Central West and Concern Group and then all these other concern groups, right? They grew like mushrooms. They were growing everywhere. Everyone started to be concerned about what was happening in their neighborhood and started to say, we don't like these changes or we don't like these transitions or we don't like the fact that we're not giving enough respect to our culture and our history. And from that time on, like I think John and Katie Law and myself, we always look back on the fact that all of the things that we tried to keep in Central, including the West Wing of the government offices, we had to really fight. We had our whole strategies and in the end, the government has now accepted it as a scheme which is called Conserving Central. And they're promoting it as a massive heritage um, project on their own right. But it's only a result of all of the collective uh, community aspects that have come in. And then that's gone on, and then Chu Hoi Dick and others looking at areas in the New Territories and the Land Justice League. All of these things. Suddenly we've gone from a focus where we must build new towns because there's a critical problem to people thinking, but this is our place. We have to look after some of the things that we respect and we grew up with. So that's a long answer to, to a very short question. Sorry. There's another question at the back. It's going to be a rather meandering way of getting... Could you hear me? No? Yes. Should be okay? Okay, fine. Um, actually, I was rather moved by the photos uh, and the video shown by the two artists, particularly because they were relating, you know, showing us the human experience and the human relationship to a very urban landscape. Then when I got to Ian, um, I got a little bit disheartened, and I would like to see if Ian would be able to elaborate more on what he thinks, or what, at least and when he was in government, uh, the quality of life is for people, because when he uh, praised Hong Kong, I heard words about height, uh, I heard convenience, and unfortunately, these are some of the things I would myself sacrifice in favour of things like equality, community, and so on. It could maybe because there wasn't enough time, but it would be nice for us, I think, to understand a bit more about what the government planners were thinking when they talked about quality of life uh, in, in an urban context. Thank you. Um, I, I left government in 1992, um, and, I, <laughs> and since then the quality of life has gone downhill. But no, no. But I, 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 I think it's a, a matter of general concern. Um, uh, I think the planners in government serve the administration they don't necessarily serve a greater vision of life. And because they work in that situation, they have to do what they do. And we can talk to them outside their official capacity, and they're saying we're doing the wrong things. 
And some of the simple things which uh, are considered wrong uh, now are because, especially under C.Y. Leung's target of we must house everything, everything is housing, 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 and they started rezoning all the open space sites, they started rezoning uh, unused sites, which a lot of cases the community saw as something of benefit. And we used to get it, you know, the town planning board, which, which I work with all the time, in, in making representations on behalf of a whole range of people. We used to get about 10 objections to a massive scheme going ahead. Now we get a minor change of someone's park being rezoned for public housing, uh, or private housing, and we'll get 10,000 objections from people in the residence or general concern. And they don't understand that what people are actually trying to do is to protect that quality of life that they're living in. They're not, you know, and, and you'll, you'll hear, I'm sure Carrie Lamb will say, I can't understand why people object to um, us rezoning sites for public housing in the neighborhood. We want you to be supportive. But these people are looking at it and saying, this is where my kid's going to grow up. What sort of environment are they going to live? I've got to do something protective. And say, so we have this massive uh, community negative effect because they don't expect that the quality of life is just housing. It's more than that. And I deal with a lot of sports bodies and we cannot find space for sport. And everyone wants their kids to be taking an act more active role. And you know, there's all sorts of figures like SARS was a massive uh, cultural change in the community where people suddenly wanted to go outside and do things instead of just going to shopping centres. And now, you know, you can look at it. I mean, those who walk the hills here, um, the country parks. I think if the government tries to rezone country parks; they'll have thousands or millions of people because. You know, one of the complaints now that the country park paths are actually more congested than Causeway Bay during a Sunday shopping centre because there are so many people going up there, you're queuing up, and if you walk across Dragon's Back now, it's like getting in a queue at one end and walking all the way across the other. And, and this quality of life is now something that people really aspire to. And I think SARS had a big change on that. But I don't think the, the focus of the, um, the government is actually on achieving that. And that's why the community fights them and why there's so much disagreement. Because quality of life is more than those those simple things. It's it's not only that, it's 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 also the time that people spend with their families and with their social groups um, that uh, are part of the quality of life and, and that's got to be built into it too. I, I do think actually we actually work less hours now because we have um, we have almost everywhere in the office sort of environment. Uh, we do have a two-day weekend, and that has been another massive change because suddenly people have this time where they want to do something else, and because of that, um, we, that's part of how do we meet that expectation and quality of life when it comes to space, to a large extent, and that's why. I'm a fan of going tall because it leaves space at the, at the ground level and we can all use that space. That's a long answer. Yeah, I might add to that. I, I was just thinking, um, my, my first involvement in a planning issue was the LegCo meetings about the Tamar site. And of course, we failed because we actually forgot about Queen's Pier which is on, on that site, on that reclamation. And, and I remember Paul, Paul Zimmerman and Christine Lowe and, and Yan Yan, who's at the back there. I mean, we, we all were very stupid because we didn't um, actually look at the site holistically. Uh, we'd forgotten about the pier and the transportation. Of course, we would never have won that battle. I mean, the government was loaded against us. But I, when we started, when Katie and I started um, our campaign to save PMQ, the, the police married quarters, it was at the same time as, as the Queen's Pier protests. And we did it a different way. 
and we won. And that's what we did was we took two planning applications and we wrote a million letters and we got lots of people involved. And we, the first planning application we, we did ourselves with the help of a, a, a planning friend. Very, very amateurish. The second one was much better with Ian. Yeah. And it took, I think, three years. And I remember we had a meeting with, with Carrie Lamb and was Katie, myself, and we met Carrie. In, in, in she was uh, development secretary then. There was only one other person in the room, and that was her pr her press officer. And we we spent two hours with Carrie, persuading her to save PMQ. And we went through everything. We went about the history because that building, you know, when when Ian showed the Mark One public housing. The precursor to that, the, the forebearer of all that, was the police married headquarters. Uh, sorry, police married quarters, which was the site of the former Queen's 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 College, which of course is over here now. But, but hang on, wait, wait, wait. So, actually, when we sat down with Carrie, she was very sceptical. And then she turned to us and said, OK, John, I'll give you... Oh, John and Katie. I'll give you police married quarters. And then she quickly turned to us and said, but whatever you do, don't try and, ch don't try and save Central Market. And we didn't say anything. <laughs> and of course we tried to save Central Market. And we... OK, it's not perfect. But if you remember rightly, the URA wanted to build two or three storeys on Central Market, and we stopped that. So actually, part of these, these, these um, you know, to be a, a good activist is perseverance. It's as simple as that. And, you know, Ian knows this. When you're planning something, you don't just do it like that. It takes time. And the same with when you're an activist. And what I was thinking when you were talking in your question over here, okay, yeah, Queen's Pier, I, I do agree, Queen's Pier was the change, but in fact, I think another site which we, we started a protest on was the Graham Street Market. I actually think that was the site that really brought people in because it went on and on and on. School groups made films and videos. There were you know, Instagram groups, there were chat groups. I think there were so many more people involved because, one, it was a 150-year-old street market and everyone went down and looked and they were part of it just by being there, by being amongst all the stalls, stalls and, and seeing the people, you know, selling and you talk to them. I think it was much more involved than the Queen's Pit. And, of course, we lost that. You know, the URA is building. Yeah, yeah. Look, just along the theme of transition, and, and she mentioned Instagram to, to us before we were talking here. Uh, we, what John's talking about, when the PMQ site was going to be, the buildings were going to be demolished and was going to be sold for three towers of residential development up on top of a two-story podium commercial centre, standard Hong Kong thing. And that's what we wanted to stop. Now... In terms of transition, what happened is Katie and John stood on the escalators for days and getting people to sign forms, right? And, and now we've moved in terms of the community involvement and, and trying to activate things and to, to do things that they want. All you need to do is to set up a, a Facebook group or a WhatsApp group or have, have something online and, and you can get 3,000 people within an hour and a half sort of thing, depending on what the subject is. And that's an incredible transition in terms of, you know, the, the um, Star Ferry protests and everything. If, if Just imagine now if um, they called for a protest. Like, I, I will never forget the... I was absolutely shocked when um, there was a protest in, uh, in Ocean Centre on... Um, Canton Road because they changed the characters 
in one of the uh, elite stalls had changed from Sim being simplified, simplified from co uh, traditional characters to simplified characters, and they weren't meeting Hong Kong people in the shops. And then instantly there was a, a, a crowd of people there to protest that sort of thing. I mean, that's an incredible transition we've gone from having to to be individuals talking to each other on a street to create a, a, an interest to actually doing everything online. And I think that's another reason why things are, are more um, disparate in the way that people look at things. There's less agreement because uh, a lot of the things that the government wants us to do no longer are actually acceptable.